the craziest strength thing you've seen from an athlete, not a power lifter. Mm -hmm. And it was this wide receiver. He weighed like 215 pounds. He came in the gym one day and the linemen were floor pressing. They were doing a fat bar, axle bar floor press. And they had 425 on the bar. They were like almost at the end of their set. He comes in cold, cold, hops on the floor, takes the bar down to the elbows, rest on the floor, pauses it, presses it, cracks it. Welcome to episode number 32. I am your host, Sebastian Engstrom. And today, Jacob Ross joins me for part two. He is an elite level NBA, NFL, MLB, professional strength and conditioning coach. He runs his own company called Smart Strength Customized Training, as well as he is for the South Sudanese team, a strength and conditioning coach for the basketball team there. He is just a powerhouse of knowledge. We go into more in depth of training, specifics of how to train to get more explosive, powerful, different methodologies of it. And uh, it's a very fascinating conversation. It's less, you can say, stories about his past, more about training as well as professional athletes, how they train and how he trained them. So enjoy this incredible episode with Jacob Ross. And if you haven't done so so far, if you're enjoying the show, please, if you're on Apple, scroll down, hit five stars. It'll be the good deed of the day. This helps us spread the message to more people. And I just want to say a personal thank you for doing this. If you're on another platform, hit subscribe, hit like, even write a review. This means the world. So thank you for doing so. And now an uninterrupted podcast with Jacob Ross. Jacob Ross, we got you back on the podcast, elite strength coach, mastermind when it comes to performance of any type, form. Dude, amazing to have you on again. Thank you for having me. I, you know, we felt like we had more to talk about uh, last time I was on. So we immediately obviously tried to make some plans to make it happen again. And here we are. Yeah. So I'm yeah. And, uh, when we start talking about this stuff and that's why, I mean, we already, what we chatted for 20 minutes and, uh, I realized, okay, well, time flies by when you're having fun. So let, let's, let's jump into this topic that we we're just talking about. Like what, what does it take to be a strength coach and have longevity? What, what does goes into, and what went into your career in that sense? you we were talking about hours. We're talking about one-on-one -on -one clients yeah, give us an insight into that and, and how long does strength coach usually stay in the industry for? Yeah, I would say um, for me particularly, um, there's, there's strength coach is a, it's a continuum, right? Like it's a process. I think the first step in that process is what we talked about last time, like when I was in college, how to train anybody for free. You just need to get a lot of hands-on experience with a lot of different kind of people and athletes. I think um, the broader you can make that and the deeper you can make that experience, I think it just sets you up to be a better shrink coach because you serve more different types of people and then you see more outcomes as a result of your, your methodology and your programming. And it just starts helping you prune away, you know, what doesn't work, what does work, where you want to move towards, what you don't want to move towards. And you start to see similarities between certain types of athletes and people and, you know, some things that don't cross over and it has to be specific to that sport or person. And the, the faster you can kind of create that well of knowledge, the more effective you become as a strength coach. And that's, but that's early in your career. You know, we were talking about this um, earlier in that, like, that's really a young, like a young person's game, right? I mean, when I was 22, 23, um, I mean, shoot, for probably like seven years, I was training Thanksgiving morning. Like I was mm. training people, you know what I mean? Like, because there was a lot of families who are, they're out of school and they, they're maybe have a workout culture in their family and they, like, hey, let's come in at 10 a.m. Thanksgiving morning and work out before, you know, we have lunch and all yeah. that stuff. And yeah. somebody, somebody's got to train those people, right? Well, I couldn't imagine now, I mean, I could imagine it, I guess, but like, you know, having three kids of my own, um, you know, my wife has a large extended family, like being like, hey guys, like I'll see you Thanksgiving afternoon. Mm -hmm. I mean, even, even uh, you know, in retail culture in America, 
um, stores are shutting down on Thanksgiving now. They're just mm-hmm. they're just not even open. Target, like like a bunch of these larger stores, Kohl's, they're like we're just not even doing it. Like Black Friday will start on Friday. Like we're mm-hmm. not even doing anything Thanksgiving night. And so you're you know seeing that shift towards like family and and being around your family. It's tough when you're as you get older and just your family connections become deeper um, to like be comfortable and, and happy doing that. So that's just an example of, of you know, a reality. And, and the other side of it is vacation. You know, when you have three kids, you kind of have to line up your vacation around their school. You know, when are they out of school yeah. um, as much as you can? One of those kind of traditional breaks within the school system that you can plan things. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're a trainer, you know, <laughs> and you at, at one point, you know, I was booked up for like six months in a row, mm-hmm. like probably 10 hours a day. Well, if I decide I want to take a vacation, I mean, you're bo- losing, you know, let's just say a couple of clients cancel on a given day. Let's say I'm losing eight hours of clients a day for a week. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, you know, that's a, that's a lot of money that you're losing because mm-hmm. you want to go on vacation. And it kind of creates always this, creates this downward pressure of like, you know, should I really be taking a vacation? Should I just keep working? Um, your clients, even though I had incredible, really, like for the most part, really, really good clients, um you also get to this place where they don't quite understand why you're taking a vacation like <laughs> even if they don't say it it's like well, well i like the training you train me uh-huh. so why are you like leaving you know it'd be like calling for some somebody you know for a haircut and then being like no like i can't do it like it's just it's frustrating for people i think sure. um and when you're training a lot of people you might get on a given week half your people clients were like cool with it and the other half like no no I'm really getting ready for this or I had this goal in mind I need you there um so it's just it's tougher as you get older because life becomes inevitably more complicated yeah. in a good way in terms of mm-hmm. your time um and it just becomes a difficult thing to do long term and so you know my advice for every young strength coach is the first part of it which is train a lot of people you know, uh, dig that well deeper of knowledge experience, dig it wider as well, you know, um, so that you can kind of cross over to a lot of different people and things. And, but then as you get older, like, you know, start building a house next to that well, that you could go in, shut the door, (laughs) you know, have a nice hot tub, like something like that. Um, so that it's, you're not constantly going to that well of training for every single thing you do, because you can't, ideally keep working for a place where you're trading your time um directly for money because if i'm training someone one-on-one for an hour that is my time for that hour i can't do anything else i can't answer an email i can't multiply myself i can't you know market myself i can't grow anything during that time other than my clients um you know strength and conditioning that's what i'm growing during that time and that's great but when you're stacking your whole day with that over and over and over, you're going to get to a place where you realize that your income is inevitably tied to your time of those people. Yeah. And I've never seen a 55 year old like strength coach who works in that capacity. Mm-hmm. Usually if you're an older strength coach, you work for a team, um, you know, you're employed by a school, um, you're somehow working for like a hospital system. Like you, you have basically enough back backup support to where your job isn't tied to that hourly, am I training someone? Your job is is more of a overall theme. I'm looking after this program. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm hiring people, I'm building this, like it's not purely training. And so you have to really make sure, I think that you're leveraging all that towards that and um, building something that's really scalable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when it comes to methodology, of training that is something we didn't necessarily touch on too much we uh, chatted some back and forth about olympic weightlifting but what your specialty seems to be is powerlifting to a degree with smart strength but there's more to it i mean you coach um professional teams and professional athletes like what what do you say what would you say your niche is and uh do you have one like what what are, what are your strengths um i mean i think every strength coach has a philosophy or tools that they gravitate towards. Mm -hmm. Um, I've tried, I think, to take the attitude of whatever works Mm -hmm. is the right thing I should gravitate towards and not get too caught up in 
what is X philosophy and like follow it until I die. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I've seen so many string coaches go down that road. And the problem with that road of, I think that this particular philosophy is the best and this is what everyone is going to do. The problem with that road is is two-sided. One side of it is that you can't definitively prove it wrong, Mm -hmm. right? Because if you do anything hard enough with purpose and intensity in terms of physical exercise, you're going to get results. Mm -hmm. If I ask you, you say, hey, Jacob, I would really like to get leaner and lose a little bit of weight. I say, okay, um, I want you to put on a weighted backpack and I want you to go run a marathon every day, Mm -hmm. right? you would lose weight, you would get leaner. Now, is is that the best thing for you to do? No, but if you really believe in it and for some reason that identifies with you, then you could always come back to me and say it worked. And so it's a a very low level argument, but it's a powerful argument because the, the, you know, again, the issue with strength conditioning is you you can see the results, right? You, You can physically see it, you can observe it very easily. So when someone sees any kind of a result, they, they equate that with effectiveness and optimization. And that's not true mm-hmm. because the other side of it is if I am following X philosophy or program, you know, kind of till the ends of the earth, so to speak, then I'm doing a disservice to my clients because I'm serving myself. Mm-hmm. I'm serving what yeah. I, what I want to do. I'm serving, you know, what my prerogative is. And there's a difference between, you know, having expertise and, and serving your client in, in what you know is best versus mm-hmm. serving what, um, you know, I guess like kind of you have built your training identity around. Mm-hmm. And so to stop speaking in Jerry gener- terms, like just practically speaking, um, I think it's a good segue into what you're talking about with Olympic lifting. You know, Olympic lifting, um, it's changed a lot since I've started strength stream- coaching a lot of stuff in strength coaching. And, um, you know, I've been doing this professionally for, I don't know, 12, 14 years, somewhere in that range, depending on where you want to start it. Um, but, you know, I've been lifting for 21 years. And when I started Olympic lifting in terms of strength conditioning was still a big deal. You know, every football team does, you know, hang cleans and snatches and, you know, mm-hmm. squat cleans and, you know, all this stuff. And then CrossFit started. And when CrossFit started, um, I think it pushed Olympic lifting back into popularity in a lot of ways, um, because you now you, it's, you need to be good at it. You know, you needed to work on this skill, et cetera. Um, you know, I've trained eight NFL pro bowlers. I've had Olympic medalists. I've had NBA all-star. I've had MLB all-stars. You know, I've had tons of collegiate athletes who are really good at their various sports. And I've never done, I've never done Olympic lifts in mm. any of those people not one single time have they requested <clears throat> it the only time i've got it requested is when they have to do it in school mm, yeah. and they f- feel like they'll be behind if they're not doing it in the summer or you know in the off, whatever right. program they are with me when they go back to school because they know that they're going to be tested on it right. and i think when you think about it like that it starts to get really dumb in terms of the reason why you're doing it because Mm -hmm. again we've all been a kid at some point even if you don't have kids and when you were a kid at some point you were like learning something like why am i learning this well because it's on the test well Mm -hmm. is that really helpful like this information is it really furthering my life like oh oh, no just learn it for the just learn the test and you're like okay all right i guess i will but like with olympic lifting and i'm not Please, Olympic no, no, please. What is your beef with Olympic lifting? Please share. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not anti-Olympic lifting. You know, if you want Olympic lift, you know, and that cranks your tracker, go for it. Um, but you have to think about why is Olympic lifting even popular? Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, because exercise physiology was, the culture was driven for a long time based on research, a very long time. Mm-hmm. And when you're doing research, what do you conduct research on? Things that are easily, easily able to replicate. They're the same. Okay. Well, a barbell is the same. Plates are the same, right? Across the world. Mm-hmm. So if I'm in a lab in Sweden or I'm a lab in the US, it doesn't matter. A barbell is a barbell, a plate is a plate, a snatch is a snatch, a clean is a clean. It's very easy to replicate <clears throat> what those things are. And again, 
you think back 50 years ago, there wasn't all the devices and, and, and exercise equipment and these different tools and modalities that we have now. It was, mm -hmm. you know, dumbbells and barbells and, you know, Arthur Jones was starting to crank out a couple of machines at Nautilus and like, that was it. Like there wasn't yeah. a ton of stuff like there is now. So you didn't really have a lot of options either. But if you boil it down to, okay, well, why am I Olympic lifting as an athlete? If I'm an NFL player, you know, like Matt Forte was one of my guys I trained. Uh, multiple pro bowler, uh, led the league in yards from scrimmage for several years, one of the best running backs, you know, of his generation for sure. Okay, well, Matt had at one point torn his tricep off the bone. Um, he had separated a shoulder. Um, his wrists stuff were always hurt because he's stiff arming people. So if he comes in and says, and I'm saying, hey, Matt, we need to, uh, man, we got to clean today, buddy. We got to keep you explosive. Mm -hmm. And he's like, Jacob, I, I can't physically bend my wrists like it's mm -hmm, been mm -hmm. fused together mm -hmm. you know my tricep is off the bone i can't get into this position yeah. if my job it's what we talked about earlier if i'm so dogmatic about my belief in olympic lifting that that's my answer i've now done a disservice to my client because it's not what's best for him so, so that's part of it if you've ever trained uh, with real i say real athletes yeah. not people who are just like you know doing this for like weekend warrior stuff the amount of injuries that these people take from contact just a result of their sport puts you in a place where Olympic lifting isn't the best outcome. Mm -hmm. So from there, you take another logical step and say, okay, well, why do we Olympic lift to train explosiveness? Okay, well, is the 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 idea of a snatch or a clean is that responsible for the explosiveness? Does your body really know what a barbell and like an Olympic clean is, or mm -hmm. is it just doing the motion? And is the motion, in fact? in charge if responsible for it and the research is really clear the research says that triple extension so movements that act at the you know hip knee and ankle are what's responsible for helping increase power mm -hmm. so if that's the case then the barbell now just becomes one of many modalities i can utilize to get that triple extension mm -hmm. right a box jump would also do it a med ball throw triple extension a med ball overhead slam triple extension flip a tire triple extension push a sled, triple extension. There's a lot of ways that I can get triple extension. And within the last, you know, probably eight years, the research has started to shift towards exploring some of these other modalities. And what they found is that they would look at groups of people who would only vertically uh, power lift and mm -hmm. in terms, not like, not like power lifting, but like, you know, Olympic lift. Yeah. And because any clean snatch is on the vertical plane versus people who would do sled work, tire work, it, it has a horizontal component as well. Mm -hmm. And those athletes always got faster, jumped higher than the people who only perform vertically because every sport in the world is a horizontal component to it. There's mm -hmm. no sport in the world where you stand in one place and jump straight up and down. It doesn't right. exist. Right. There's, you have to run right, left, forward, backwards, whatever the case may be. So if there's better options, I can take it, let's say I take a, a, an athlete, let's go back down to like the kid level, a 12 year old kid. Mm -hmm. They come in my gym and they want to get more powerful. Okay. Do I need to put them on a PVC, piece of PVC pipe and teach, you know, front rack position and go through, you know, my first pull, my second pull. Mm -hmm. Do I need to do that for eight weeks, 12 weeks, mm -hmm. and then get progress them to like a 20 pound bar, you know, like, or a 15 kilo bar, like, and then like slow, like, or, or. Could I say, here's an appropriate size tire for you, weighs 90 pounds, you know, flip the tire. He goes, yeah. oh, okay. I just, they just bend down and flip it. Mm -hmm. it, it takes hardly any coaching. Yeah. So not only can I literally start training them right away, I can actually train them more effectively according to the research. So when you start adding those things up or a med ball slam, hey, pick it up on your toes, slam it down, box jump, jump on the box. Like if I, if I can simplify yeah. their training to a way that the research actually shows is actually more effective then for the athlete, that's a win. And if now me as a coach, if I was raised up under a guy who really believed in Olympic lifting or a woman who really believed in Olympic lifting, and that's my philosophy, that's my prerogative. I just, I love Olympic lifting. Then by me forcing that athlete to go down that road, am I doing them a service or am I doing myself a service? Right. Right. And these are the questions that I think a lot of strength and conditioning coaches are not asking themselves. They're just blindly following. And it doesn't have to be Olympic lifting. Let, let's take powerlifting, right? Okay, you mentioned powerlifting. So there's a lot of strength coaches, especially in football, you know, U.S. football culture, where they think that um, their athletes need to powerlift. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, they squat, they bench, et cetera. Well, 
is a low bar, straight bar, barbell squat the best thing for someone's shoulder and wrists? I pose the same question as Olympic yeah. lifting. Yeah. I would say no. Is someone who trained a lot of NFL players, you know, over 100 mm -hmm. really good NFL players. We did not straight bar, low bar squat. We didn't do it. Mm -hmm. We would use the safety squat bar because mm -hmm. why? Why do I need to have them in this, you know, arms back, lockhead, uh, you know, five, 600 pounds, like pushing on their shoulders or put them in a safety squat bar? There's no shoulder mobility restrictions there. Mm -hmm. um, you're still squatting, you're still working, you know, posterior chain, you're still getting the same motion. It's just a lot safer and easier to get into. Mm -hmm. And there's in, now same thing with deadlift. We would very rarely pull straight bar conventional deadlift from the floor. Again, why? If you're a football player, you need to be strong for football. You don't need to be strong for powerlifting. So if I can do a trap bar deadlift, and, and we get we get a similar effect, or a rack pull, or a wagon wheel deadlift, or a block pull, like there's so many ways that are safer to get these responses for an athlete um, than to go with quote unquote like traditional powerlifting. And again, my job as a strength coach is to serve my clients, not myself. So I might like the power lift personally, that's fine. But that doesn't mean that every single athlete that I train needs to power lift. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, that was a long response. I think that was perfect. <laughs> no, I, I really appreciate that. What, so what would you, be your top exercises for explosive to create explosiveness in an athlete? Um, somewhat depends on the age, I think. Um, but in general, I think sled work is highly, highly undervalued. Mm -hmm. um, pushing sleds, pulling sleds. You can do sled cleans. Um, I posted that before on Instagram. Um, huh. Yeah, you got to see it. It's kind of hard to explain. Um, but like, the thing about a sled, sled work is it's always dynamic, right? It's always mm -hmm. movement based, and there's no eccentrics in it. Zero, mm -hmm. right? Aside from whenever your foot hits the turf and that little bit of like stretch reflex, but like, there's no, most soreness happens when training from eccentrics. And eccentrics aren't a bad thing. I use a lot of tempo work. But when I'm talking about training athletes and I need to get somebody ready for a game or a performance, if I can minimize eccentrics and still train, then I'm doing them a service because I'm not beating them up as much. Mm -hmm. So sled work, when you step forward, you know, there's a little bit of stretch reflex, but then as soon as you push, it's a concentric push. Mm -hmm. And when your leg is in a recovery phase, there's no eccentric there. Right. right. Your leg isn't doing any work. It's not like a squat where you're lowering the way down. So um, I think sleds are a, such an important way to train power and but also to stay powerful, even in season as you're preparing for performances and games. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you're in shape, it doesn't cost the athlete a lot to continue to do those things. And again, I'm not talking about running somebody into the ground with sleds, like we're doing sled sprints. I'm talking like playing methodical, you know, power sets of sled work. Mm -hmm. um so so again for example um i trained my athletes under a conjugate style system mm -hmm. now i don't mean conjugate like west side barbell because again we just talked about like we didn't necessarily power lift yep. so like for instance for us on a max lower day we i think athletes need heavy stimulus if they play american football i mean if you're talking about a you know 260 pound man running you know uh, four, six, 40, running into another 220 pound person, there's a lot of force involved. You yep. have to prepare your tissue for that. So there is some heavy lifting that needs to be done, but you need to do it as safely as possible. And like one thing we would do is we'd have the prowler, right? Which is like, you know, kind of a triangle sled with the post on either side. We'd say, okay, today for our max effort, we're going to load the prowler up. What's the heaviest weight you can push for 10 yards? Mm -hmm. What is that? Yes. So they push it 10 yards. If they did it, great. We throw up two plates on, do it again, two plates mm -hmm. on. That's heavy stimulus, right? It's right. not loading them up with like a low bar squat where I'm crushing their shoulders and their neck and everything else. So there, there's ways of going about it, modifying these things to serve, you know, to serve your purpose. So I think sled work is great. Um, I think for a lot of younger athletes, I think med ball work is also undervalued. Mm -hmm. med ball slams med ball throws um you know split stance med ball slams med ball throws into the wall um it's again uh, minimal or zero eccentric on those things um it's scalable easily you can get a four pound med ball up to you know the heaviest med ball i've ever seen is a 200 pound med ball mm. um we used, we used to have one for our nfl guys and they would break it because you know throwing they're strong enough to throw it but just the weight of 200 pound med ball slamming on the over and over and over like eventually it would break but 
Yeah. We just ordered like four a year and that's just part of the cost of doing business. But um, I think med balls are highly undervalued. I think band work is highly undervalued. Mm. Um, you know, band work forces over speed eccentrics. Um, it forces you to speed up to that eccentric motion. So if you're talking about a banded squat or, you know, um, even just like a banded row, like you don't even need weight, right? Bands you can tie on anything. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a great way to train power. It, and another thing about bands is this, it flips the force curve. I don't know if you want to get into this or not, but like n- nor- normally if you're, um, normally if you're squatting and you're going, uh, with free weight, right. As you go down, the weight gets harder, the lower you mm-hmm. go. As you stand up, the higher you go, the easier it gets. That's mm-hmm. a normal force curve for any lift under the sun. That's gravity, mm-hmm. right? Unless you're on a machine and for some reason the physics have been flipped. Well, if you are add bands to it, now the opposite is true. As you go down, the band shrink, shrinks, which means the weight actually gets lighter. And mm-hmm. as you stand up, the band stretches, it means it gets heavier. Mm-hmm. And if I'm talking about an athlete and we, all we ever do is free weight, as they stand up and the weight gets easier, they have to slow down. You mm-hmm. have to. Mm-hmm. You're going to blow your kneecaps out if you if you finish your squat at the same speed that you came out of the hole with, right? You slow yeah. down as you kind of come to that end. So you're teaching your nervous system to slow down as it's finishing its extension, which is not optimal when you're talking about that. That's a spot where sprinting happens. That's a spot where running happens when you finish that extension, right? So if you throw bands on it, now I flipped it. I'm teaching them to actually increase the amount of force as they're getting towards the like finishing that extension which mm-hmm. is what you want to be most powerful right at that point when they push off of the turf or the court or whatever the case would be um and then also just safety if people usually don't miss a squat at the top they miss in the hole right so if you're talking about athletes not powerlifting, then why wouldn't i put my athletes in position to be the loaded lightest in the hole and heaviest when it's safest so there's, there's just so many aspects of this that, that I think a lot of strength coaches, I don't want to just knock people and say they don't think through it like that, like they're dumb or unintelligent. I think some of this you have to train, it goes back to what we said at the beginning, you have to train enough people to have experienced these problems, right? right? You, and, and then based on those experiences and those issues, you now formulate solutions. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have the experience with enough people, you haven't had ran into enough problems. And if you haven't ran into enough problems, how can you have the answers? Like, Mm -hmm. why would you have the answers? If all you've ever sat down for a math test is, you know, one plus one, then why do you need to know anything else? Like, you don't need to. And so um, I think the experience piece of it is key. But bands, you know, sleds, med balls. Um, I think those are great tools for any athlete, especially younger athletes. Um, and then as you get older, I would say, um, in terms of training power, you know, especially bars, bars that change how the weight is, um, hitting your joints. So you can continue to train at the appropriate, you know, intensity and weight for your sport, but not compromise, you know, your joints, because again, we're training movement patterns and muscles. So if you can use a multi-grip bar, you know, some people call it a football bar or whatever, as opposed to a straight bar bench, you know, straight bar flat bench is probably one of the worst things you can do for your body. And I don't mean that like, like you shouldn't do it. I'm not one of those people like, Uh you know, oh, you should never do this. It's not that. It's just, I'm around some of the best powerlifters in the world and it's just not optimal. You know, your pec, it's funny when you talk to people, they don't understand like pec anatomy and like, what does it actually do? You know, your pec is a triangle muscle and it literally brings your arm right from your side down to your body, right? Like adduction, like that's, that's literally what it does. Mm -hmm. So a bench press on a flat is nothing to do with that motion, Mm -hmm. (laughs) hardly anything actually. Mm -hmm. So you're, and you know, I always tell people too, and if anybody's watching this on video, they'll get a crack, they'll get a, uh, you know, they'll crack up about this. But like when you run, you run with your arms by your side. Sure. You don't run with your arms up here, right. like, you know, like this, but yes. that's how you bench. Yes. So like, this is, a, this is a comfortable or natural in any way, shape or form. Right. This is. So yeah. your arms are by your side. You can get into that, like a multi-grip bar allows you to do that. That's how your shoulder likes to slide. That's how you like sure. to move through that motion. So again, if you're not powerlifting, if you're not training for a sport, the outcome has to match the training, mm-hmm. right? If I'm powerlifting, yeah, you got a straight bar bench, got a straight bar squat, have to do those things. Even that, you know, you can be smart about too, but you have to do those things. If you're an NFL player or a basketball player, you know, or an MLB player, 
why why do you have to do those things in a certain way? I think the answer should be what's best for the athlete, and that's that's the way you should approach it. We can, we can get into a lot of the fun topics like the the combine and the <laughs> bench press test, how many <laughs> reps you can do, and that should be uh, a testament to how strong you are. I mean, it's I'm not the biggest fan of the bench press. I'll just tell you that, even though I have okay numbers I've, I've worked my way up to it but that's the exercise that has injured me the most out of any exercise mm-hmm. it is so freaking detrimental i mean and you just spoke to the movement pattern and why uh but yeah there is this unfortunate culture of that if you're a man you should be able to bench press a lot of weight and it's pretty much yeah you're going to wreck your body in one point or another because it's just going to it's going to break you down so well, glad and, and- yeah <laughs> I want to say, like, the thing that I've tried to help younger lifters understand now that I'm a, a little bit older is look at professional strongmen, right? Mm-hmm. These guys can log press, you know, um, 200 kilos, some of these guys. Mm. And if you can log press, you know, 200 kilos, 440 pounds, whatever that works out to be, what do you think you can bench press? Mm. 500 pounds, 600 pounds, easily easily Mm -hmm. because your shoulders are so freaking strong so i've told people i've never almost i don't think i've ever seen someone get injured from an overhead press i don't i don't think i've ever seen it in my entire life i don't think i've known anybody to do it Mm -hmm. um i've seen people with hurt shoulders from sports who can't overhead press but Mm -hmm. i've never seen someone get injured from overhead pressing i've seen a lot of people get injured from bench pressing i've seen Mm -hmm. pecs tear i've rehabbed Mm -hmm. uh our buddy huck finn you know he's he's torn both pecs off you know i rehabbed the second one and um i've heard my pack bench pressing before powerlifting you know mm-hmm. um and, and and to your point you know some people would maybe counter with well you shouldn't be going heavy on it and it's like well if the sport is powerlifting you really don't have a choice <laughs> like yes. that, that, is, yeah, yeah. that is that is the sport and yeah. also to your point you know i've done a lot of heavy squats done a lot of heavy deadlifts and I've never significantly injured myself doing those things. Right. Again, not that it's not possible. It's all about mitigating risk. Sure. And just the risk, the risk of the movement is it's just going to be higher for a bench press. Yeah. You mentioned conjugate style training, but I don't think you really went into like what's your approach to that? Yeah. Um, you know, I've been to West Side Barbell. Um, I went for two or three days um, with a friend of mine who used to train there in the 80s. Mm-hmm. And it's cool because you know you can't just show up to West Side. You have to be invited, um, or you have to reach out and kind of plan it. Uh, they don't like people just showing up at the private gym. And um, so I was able to go, which is which is really cool because I went uh, was it three years ago now. You know, Louis getting up there in age. I don't, I don't. Um, you know, gosh, you know, he's almost died a couple of times in his life. So maybe he'll live to be, you know, 150. But <laughs> you just have to think practically and say, you know, maybe the guy isn't going to make it forever. So sure. um, I wanted to go see him in person because I think he's one of the, um, you know, most intelligent strength coaches, you know, within our within our mm-hmm. time for sure. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now Louis would be the first person to tell you he said it many times. He has adopted the original like conjugate style of training and modified it and optimized it for what Westside Barbell does. Mm -hmm. But the definition of conjugate training isn't Westside Barbell. They've become synonymous because Louis is so influential and so popular Mm -hmm. and he's so opinionated that that it's hard for a lot of people to disassociate those two things. Um, But they're not the same thing. Conjugate is a methodology of training and Westside Barbell is his application of that methodology, right? Um, so like for me, I have my own application of it. Um, I do believe that conjugate is, is a lot smarter method of training um, than kind of Western uh, linear periodization. Mm-hmm. Um, linear periodization, again, if, you, if you're not dogmatic in your belief and you're willing to like think through this, is really, really dumb way of training, again, when you've trained high-level athletes. Because if I have, let's just take, let's take Matt Forte again, okay? You know, Matt Forte retired from the NFL at 32, I think. All right. So when he was 28, 27, 26, he'd been in the league three or four years at that point. Um, They're drafting and bringing in running backs that are three or four years younger than him Mm -hmm. every single year. 
And that number gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Now they're five years younger than him. Now they're seven years younger than him, right? Yep. Your clock is ticking, buddy. Yep. So when you go into mini camp, when is it appropriate for Matt Forte not to be fast in mini camp, even in February, right after the season, March? Like, when is it appropriate for him not to be fast? It doesn't exist. There's mm-hmm. not a time. Yeah. So if I'm doing linear periodization and I say, you know what, February through April, we're going to just do strength. Mm-hmm. By definition of focusing on one thing, I'm not focusing on other things. I'm not focusing on speed. I'm not focusing on, you know, some people would say agility. There's a lot of different things you can, you can quote unquote program. So for them, I'm doing him a disservice by not working on his speed year round. Yeah. I'm doing him a disservice by emphasizing one thing to the point that I'm de-emphasizing other things because that's not a professional athlete. Being a professional athlete is being at your best and working towards that continuously. And when your job is literally on the line every single year and they're literally hiring your replacement every single year underneath you, people right. don't understand that. They don't work in those kind of environments. You can't go to a place where I'm saying, you know what, we're going to show up to mini camp not in great shape. We're just going to be really strong. The coach is going to say, what's wrong with you? You're so fat. You're yeah. slow. Yeah. And then, then the conversations go right up to the GM. Of, well, you know, Matt's not looking so good. I don't know what's going on with this guy. They want you, and whether it's right or wrong, it doesn't matter. It's reality. They want you to look the same in March as they do in summer, as they do on kickoff. They mm-hmm. want you to look the same because that gives them confidence that you can be the same year after year after year. And if right. you can do that, you can make a lot of money. And if you can't do that, they're just going to replace you because there's literally thousands of people who want your job mm-hmm. and are coming out of college every year looking for your job. So the thing I like about conjugate is you work on everything within a week. You work on dynamic effort, you know, which is speed, power work. Um, You work on maximal effort strength. You work on hypertrophy. uh, My stuff always included like prehab, every single bit of it, which you could get into mobility and, and, you know, all this kind of stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Um, So my system would combine all those things to work in it within a week, actually four days. And that's how I train. Um, Because again, Another problem with tenure, with westernized like linear periodization is the amount of time it takes. Mm-hmm. So again, working with with high level athletes, if I have a guy for six weeks right after the season, then they have to go to mini camp for a week, and then their wife says, you know, hey, we need to take the kids on vacation. They go away for another week, and then they come back to me. So six weeks with me, two weeks away, they come back, and I had them going from a you know a strength phase into a power phase. Well, now they've missed two weeks. So where do I go from there? Like, mm-hmm. do I do I go back? Do I restart the phase? Does it, you know, some people say, well, you just go right into the next one. Well, then do the phases really matter then? If I could just willy-nilly jump into it? Like, mm-hmm. that westernized periodization really works best for um, sports like Olympic lifting, you know, power lifting, um, to some extent sprinters, where you have complete control for 12, 16 weeks, right? Um, some collegiate programs where you have to be there, you don't have a choice. Like those things make sense for a professional athlete. A conjugate model is what makes sense. I think for a developing athlete, a conjugate model is what makes sense because mm-hmm. they need to be working on everything. You know, if you're 14, 15, 16, I don't need to be emphasizing one thing over the other. I need to be developing the entire athlete and putting them in a position to do so. Um, and I would still argue that even if you had control for somebody over, you know, 16 week period that I think conjugate has its upsides. And if you really like drill down and look at some of the better performing teams uh, like Clemson, Clemson's been, uh, you know, crazy good football team for a long time. Yeah. Uh, they drink hot, they drink conjugate, um, you know, Alabama, like, and what's funny, this is, this is my favorite thing. There's always, everybody trains conjugate at some point. If you do strength work, everybody. Mm-hmm. I've seen, I've been around long enough now to see power lifters and other athletes say, oh, I don't believe in bands. I don't believe in chains and this. And then five, six years later, they're using boxes, they're using chains, they're using slingshots, which is a band. Uh, you know, yeah. they're, they're, varying, they're varying their methods to get a different outcome. And mm-hmm. that's conjugate. Conjugate is saying that I'm going to use whatever tools are at my disposal to work on everything. Mm-hmm. And people always come around to it because, you know, Louis Simmons says this. I don't want to take credit for it. He's like, the weights aren't going to change. You have to get smarter than they are. Mm. The weight's always going to be the weight, right? So at some point, that weight is going to beat you. It's going to. And you have to figure out, how can I be smarter than the weights are? How can I, how can I outsmart the weights? What can I be doing for my body? 
to get better than I was before. And it's, you know, usually doing the same thing over and over and over in strength training, you get to a place where it does work for a while, but then you start to see performance, you know, decrease, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, basic, basic exercise physiology tells you this, you know, principle of specificity, et cetera, but um, people still, for some reason, try to cheat that and like find a workaround around it. But anyway, sorry, mm -hmm. again, long answer. No, dude, <laughs> this, is, this is why you're here. Please keep, keep after it. When it comes to fueling your body for this, um, actually, before we go into fueling your body, most, when we go into rest, when we get, go into workout duration, do you, are you, are you a fan of, I mean, West side, for example, I have like you rest one minute between each set. Like, I like that style. I've adopted that style. Uh, Tom and I spoke to it as well. Like, yeah, put a majority of your exercises before the big lift not the other way around and it's not your traditional mm -hmm. approach and i'm completely with that i've done that for years myself mm -hmm. what 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 is your approach to yeah a regular session and also rest in that session as well as a weekly structure like you, you like a specific you, you're a fan of like for example crossfit has three days on one off two days on one off like what 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 are your thoughts philosophy on this well, first of all, I'd let you know what CrossFit athletes you're talking to, because I don't know anybody that follows that. <laughs> really? I mean, it's it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday off, Friday, Saturday, Sunday off, or like Thursday sometimes. Like, yeah, go ahead. Every, every CrossFit athlete I know is Monday through Saturday, and if you can beg them to stop on Sunday, maybe occasionally they will, so that they can go sure. do another activity, like right. flag football or something. Yeah. Like, CrossFit is the definition of overtraining. Right. Um, when, yes. I, when I was at EFT, um, the gym that I used to run, we did a crossover event during NFL Combine every year. And the crossover event was really cool. Uh, Progenics, which was one of our sponsors, mm -hmm. they would fly in the top CrossFit athletes. Mm -hmm. And they would train side by side for like four days with our NFL Combine athletes. Mm -hmm. It was super cool. And... So, you know, I got to train um, literally at that time, you know, uh, the best CrossFitters in the world. And I got to see actually in person, what are they really doing? Because I've yeah. always been curious, right? Yeah. Like, what, yeah. are these, what, are they, what are they really doing? Both men and women, they sent both. And, um, you know, what's, oh man, I got to remember the guy's name. Uh, is it Ben Smith? Yeah. Who won, who won the games that yeah, one year? At one point, yeah. Yep. Yeah, he won it once, right? Yep. So it, yeah, him, his brother Dane, his brother Alec, they all came. Okay. Mm -hmm. Noah Olson came, uh, a couple other guys, and anyway. So like the thing that I found fascinating about Ben was he was a strategy-based exercise person. Mm -hmm. So when when I would train my NFL guys and we're training for, you know, a uh, 40-yard dash, it's an intensity-based thing. We're not going to be doing reps forever. We actually are going to take even longer breaks than that because we're trying to maximize power and speed for sprinting. Um, so you have to give all out and then you have to take like a break and then give all out again, sure. right? And then when we would set up our circuits, we would kind of encourage a similar style. Even if the rest were timed for a minute or two, um, we would still encourage like all out effort because again, and it's a football play. When is it appropriate to give half effort? Like it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. You give your yeah. all for five, six, seven plays if you're lucky, and then it's someone else's turn. So right. that's just how it works, right? It's like hockey. You go out and skate your shift. You don't halfway skate it. You full skate it. And you get off and someone else goes on. Well, Ben would never give what I would say 100% all-out effort because he knew in his mind, I've still got another hour of workout left, and yeah. I'm going to work out again in the middle of the day, and I'm going to work out again at night. Mm -hmm. And like Ben was fascinating because the strategy that he utilized to get through his days so that he was consistently working at a high effort was unmatched. I don't think I've ever seen that from someone else. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why he won the games. I think he won the games because he wasn't necessarily the best at everything. Mm -hmm. He was consistently the best. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And like that was, I think, his calling card as an athlete. Nobody ever said that this guy was the strongest or the fastest or the whatever. He was just really consistent every yeah. single event in that year that won it for him. Um, you know, he wasn't, I wouldn't say he was dominant like a Rich Froning was. Like Rich right. Froning was dominant, right? Yeah. So 
Um, so the, the point being is like, um, when it comes to rest intervals, it's always based on, you know, what the outcome is for the athlete. So if you're CrossFit and your competition is going to be five or six events over three day or three or two days, then you do have to kind of overtrain. You do have to, your training frequency has to go up. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a smart coach, you're programming in such a way that you're, you're waving what I would call your waving intensity throughout your week. So you have a high Metcon day. You might even have a low strength day where you're not getting your heart rate up hardly at all. It's just pure strength work. You might have a skill work day where you're doing some of your skill work. And then obviously you have to blend those things to, to mimic the workouts that are going to be done. Mm -hmm. But you're waving your intensity throughout the week. You know, some days are high intensity, some days are low. And you're, you're creating a plan that allows for somewhat of recovery um, within your week while you're working out, yep. right? Um, another example of that would be, you know, how we train our powerlifting athletes at Smart Strength. We do three-week waves, um, which is similar to what Westside does, where... You know, we do a certain percentage in volume week one, week two, um, the weight goes up, the volume goes down a little, week three, the weight goes way up, the volume goes down, but then we reset the wave on week four. So week four starts okay. back over. Yes. We drop the weight down again and we increase the volume. So we're waving. So when you do that, you're deloading every three weeks, yes. essentially, Yes. right? And if you don't need to take like a quote unquote, like the quote unquote, like, you know, I guess classic deload where you just sit around for like a week. So I think with CrossFit, it has to be a similar thing um, when, you're, when you're training in that style where you're waving your intensity because you can't afford to just really sit. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the issue with CrossFit is the same issue that uh, we talked about from the very beginning. It's such a good question that you asked, is that a lot of CrossFit coaches don't have enough experience training lots of different kinds of people and the outcomes associated with that. So they're they're trying to implement the sport without necessarily understanding the outcomes of what they're implementing yet and by the time that athlete has, has gotten to that point usually they're they're burnt out uh, i mean crossfit you know they used to i haven't looked at the numbers like this year but they usually have the highest rate of incidence of any kind of strength training exercise in terms of injury rate sure. um Probably and it's, it's because yeah, I mean, it's because yeah. um, the frequency of the training and, and the style of lifting. I mean, they're asking people, you know, you are a calisthenics expert. You are um, a gymnastics expert. You know, I think you're an Olympic expert, right? Right. right? You understand more than most people that you could pick one of those things, just one, study it your whole life mm -hmm. and, and maybe, maybe be good enough to call yourself an expert, right? Sure. Like gymnastics, I mean, gymnastics, like you can't just say I'm going to halfway do gymnastics, right. you know, Olympic lifting, the best Olympic lifters in the world, they do it their whole life. And maybe they can say to the best, right? Yes. Gymnastics. I mean, we also do the Olympics. Like how many times do you see somebody you're like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. And then their score is like a seven out of 10. And you're like, how's that a seven? They're like, well, you haven't seen this person. Like, it's just so hard to be the best at that. And we all seen the stories too, especially in the U.S., like Simone Biles, like how much she trained as a kid, like how much she still trains and to, to maintain that and the effect that it has on you. CrossFit, you're saying, I'm going to take those three things <laughs> and combine them into one workout. And I'm going to ask you to go, you know, at a high intensity for those things. It's just, it's just a recipe for, um, you know, something to go wrong. And so that's why I'm not the biggest fan of it um, for a sport. Now, in terms of training, I would be hypocrite if I didn't say um, I like the variation of it because mm -hmm. I do. Yeah. I, I, I do. I just think I just I, the idea of CrossFit, I love I love a lot. I just think, again, what we talked about at the beginning, when you have some people who are really dogmatic to what I would call like the old school style CrossFit um, versus people now who are, I think, a lot smarter with their training, they're using other implements, you know, you're not necessarily you know, doing a snatch or clean every day, you might be doing a kettlebell snatch, right? Or a dumbbell snatch. That didn't happen 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. It really didn't. You know, sleds, like that stuff didn't exist in CrossFit really that much 10 years ago. You know, you're seeing like air bikes and ski ergs and like all this stuff is like utilized at such a higher rate than it used to be. Right. Um, be because you need ways of, of varying your training and keeping intensity. Um, so, you know, rest intervals, like, you know, within your workout or even within your week, it all depends on the outcome. If you're training power, it's it's pretty simple. You want to have as many powerful reps as possible to practice that skill. So, you know, more rest. 
Um, like at Westside, you talking about the minute rest that they take. I've mm-hmm. seen those guys lift. It's insane. Mm-hmm. Um, when they're doing their dynamic squats, they might have 300 pounds of band on the bar, you know, anywhere between three and 500 pounds of straight weight. And there's four guys. One guy's running the mono, two guys are spotting, one guy's lifting. As soon as that guy racks the bar, the guy who's on the right side of the mono gets ready to lift. The guy who was running it moves over, loads the weight. The guy who just got done lifting moves over, loads the weight on the other side. Hmm. And the guy who was spotting on the left runs the mono on the right. They literally, like, it's like a machine. It's Hmm. insane. Hmm. They all know the person's weight and what their job is for that. And they literally lift. If you're an individual lifter, almost every minute on the minute. And these guys are doing speed squats with, you know, at the top, it feels like eight or 900 pounds. Hmm. Speed squats (laughs) up and down. So like, you know, Louis Simmons has said many times, like, you have to be in good enough shape to do this training. Because again, if if you're really picking apart what I said, you could say that, wait a second, Jay, if you just said, if you're training for power, you need to have as much rest as possible to be powerful. But yet you're saying that Westside does one minute breaks, which is probably not enough rest. If you're in shape for it, it's enough rest. Mm. If you're not in shape for it, it's not enough rest. So how much rest did you get? Well, you should get what's appropriate for you. (laughs) Mm -hmm. right so like if you came to me for the first time to train i would probably give you longer rest breaks because i don't know where you're at and i would err on the side of caution as you get in better shape and you know more and more about what i'm expecting from you we can train you to a place where a minute rest seems like a really long time to you Mm -hmm. again it just depends on your outcomes and the athlete and what you're trying to work for yeah so going into um habits that aid high performance and part of that is fuel so let's start with fuel so food what is your take on food for athletes and we'll go <laughs> into bit. stories on that because i know there's a lot of good ones you probably have um, i'd say i'm a bad person to ask because i've been i've been blessed to be in situations where i've seen the best athletes in the world mm-hmm. and rarely very rarely is their nutrition on par with their athleticism? Right. Very rare that those things are equated. Um, I would say this. I would say that fueling yourself properly, um, you know, eating leaner, leaner proteins, um, eating, you know, good, good sources of carbohydrates, mix of complex and simple, you know, getting vegetables that don't mess with your stomach. I think that's important. Some people just eat vegetables like, mm-hmm like um because they see it on instagram and and you know some influencers doing it and you know they're like literally like farting up a storm you know yep. crop dusting people right and left and they're right. still like oh give me more of it because it's good for me it's like no your body doesn't really react well with that find a different vegetable Thank you, you know like a lot of people, yes. yeah <laughs> like a lot of people don't respond well with broccoli you know um well eat spinach i mean come on like what's right. the what's the trade-off there right like spinach is easy on your stomach broccoli is not for most people mm-hmm. so um, you know, there's, there's never a downside to doing that. I would say that the more athletic you are, the better your training is, the less important that is to your outcome. Because I've seen guys who literally drink orange juice and eat Starburst for breakfast. I've seen them come in the gym, do hour and a half, two hour workouts, you know, squatting the world, sprinting, jumping, they're four or 5% body fat. They had long, healthy NFL careers. Mm-hmm. They didn't have a high risk of injury. They, none of that stuff. I've seen that mm-hmm. several times, yeah. but they're so gifted athletically that I don't think it would matter. Even me as a coach, I don't think I'd like transform them athletically. I think I just guided them athletically. If that makes mm-hmm. sense. Yes. Right. Yeah, like they're going to sure. be great athletes, regardless of what I do. Yeah. My goal is not to get in their way. It's just to kind of guide them the right way. Then there's been athletes that I've trained who I would say, yeah, like I probably made them a good athlete because they were not athletic. Mm-hmm. Those people, they have to focus harder on their food. Um, they have to focus harder on how they're fueling. Now, in a perfect world, you know, even your high, high, naturally gifted athletic people are also eating well, but it's very rare that that happens Yes. because if you're not good at something, you're going to do everything you can to be good at it, right? Mm -hmm. If you're already good at something, then your thought is, why doesn't, 
why do I need to change? If I've been yeah. eating Starburst and orange juice for breakfast, then why does it matter? Yeah. I'm doing just fine. Mm-hmm. It's it's hard to argue with that logic. Now, um, you know, uh, Derrick Rose is a really good example, right? Derrick Rose was the youngest MVP in NBA history. He played with Lou All, so I, I know some of this stuff, like, you know, for a fact. Derrick, like, pregame meal used to be like McDonald's, CD Skittles. He didn't really lift. Because from Derek's standpoint, he wasn't like anti-lifting or anti-working. It wasn't anything like that. But from Derek's standpoint, because Lou used to tell him like, hey, you got to like, you know, clean this up. Well, why? I was the best basketball player since I've been a, literally like a little kid. I was best mm-hmm. in high school, best in college, literally the best in NBA at 21 years old. Literally, MVP. Yeah. Nobody's yeah. better than me. What do I need to change for? Right? right. He's not wrong. Guy was MVP. Well, until he had an injury. And I think, I think that's where you start to see those little things add up. I think that's mm-hmm. where you start to see the nutrition matter. I think that's where you start to see your training matter more because it took him a very long time to get somewhat back to where he used to be from that injury, much yes. longer than most athletes. Yeah. But I think it's because he didn't train a lot and his, his diet wasn't great. He had to learn those things. Yeah. Now you fast forward to when we, but he never, he never, he never really came back to the same again, though. That, that's an interesting. No, too. no. Um, but like you fast forward to when we were in Minnesota, Derek was also on that team with Lou and Timberwolves. Mm-hmm. It's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Derek literally travels with a medicine ball under his arm. Literally. Oh. Huh. He has a special medicine ball. It's like his thing. And when he goes on the private plane, he's carrying it. He has his bag in one hand, his medicine ball underneath his arm. He literally mm-hmm. doesn't go anywhere without it. The guy trains all the time now. Like he trains like a nut. He eats healthy and does everything. And if you followed his career, you know, a little bit, you'll see like he's on the Knicks now. The guy's playing 26, 28 minutes a night. And he's considered a really good player even still. He's closing out games for them. The Knicks are a good team. You know, like it goes to show you how much the training and nutrition can help someone, right. even an athlete that good. It just for him, it, I think it took him an injury for him to really understand it. And that's unfortunate. Like in a perfect world, you just figure those things out. Yeah. You know, my, Michael Jordan, everybody watched the last dance. I mean, the guy smoking a cigar the whole time. He didn't pick that up after training. I mm-hmm. mean, after basketball, right? The guy yeah. smoked by all accounts, you know, um, would, would, would party like most professional athletes do. Like it's, Michael Jordan was undeniably the greatest player of his generation, you know, in my opinion, all time. We don't have to have that debate. But mm-hmm. um, the guy was smoking cigars and drinking, you know, like. For some, for some athletes, I'm just talking like weekend warriors who are like, ooh, like Uber into whatever sport they're into, whether it's powerlifting or CrossFit or triathlons or whatever it is, they'd be like, oh, you, you can't do that. Yeah. And it's like, Michael Jordan did it. Mm-hmm. How, can you, how can you deny his athleticism? Like it, it all is on this continuum of what is your natural gift? And then how much are you willing to, to quote unquote, like sacrifice to, to push that a little bit further? If you're a really good athlete, you know, and your in your in your nutrition is perfect, you might push yourself, you know, one or two percent further. And if you're a really good athlete, that's a lot, mm-hmm. right? But if you're not as good as an athlete, your nutrition might push you 10, 15, 20 percent further. Right. And people always say, like, you know, abs are made in the kitchen. Oh my gosh, that's such BS. I can't tell you how many people I've seen with abs who literally <laughs> show up with bags of McDonald's, wings, like they, they have, you know, 12 packs, like. It, it's abs in your body fat is a lot to do with what your genetic hand is dealt and the worse that genetic hand is in terms of like body composition the more that it matters that's actually the right way to say it mm-hmm. yeah um again this one guy i know he played in the nfl as a wide receiver um you know uh, this somebody asked me this on instagram like what's the most athletic thing or str- the craziest strength thing you've seen from an athlete not a power lifter mm-hmm. and it was this wide receiver he weighed like 200 215 pounds he it's walked in the receiver. gym one day oh no no not anymore goodness gracious these guys nowadays like dj metcalf you know he's like 235 240 you know 64 65 like that's becoming Man. the norm now you yeah, know like the little guys are phasing out um yeah. but you know landon his name is landon cox he came in the gym one day and the linemen were floor pressing they were doing a fat bar axle bar floor press and they had 415, 425 on the bar. They were like almost at the end of their sets. He comes in cold, cold, hops on the floor, takes the bar down to his elbows, rest on the floor, pauses it, presses it, racks it. 
right? The guy's 215 pounds. Mm-hmm. He decided after his NFL career, he wanted to do a physique show. Okay. Uh-huh. My wife, Alicia, Alicia, obviously Ross, but used to be Harris. She um, won six at, at the Olympia twice and bigger. She's mm-hmm. one of the best, you know, best built women in the world. Mm-hmm. She said, yeah, you know, like I'll help you coach. I'll coach you for whatever. And because we, we're, you know, you're all friends and what, no problem. We said, well, when is it? He said, oh, it's in three weeks. Hmm. Oh, okay. Um, and this show was an NPC show, which is like the largest feeder organization to IFBB. And this show in the Midwest is one of the largest amateur shows in the country. Yeah. And he wanted to do it in three weeks. So, okay, we'll, we'll try our best. Now the guy walks around at like 4% body fat, seriously, like <laughs> legitimately like 4% Jeez. body fat. Yeah. yeah. So we, we trained him for three weeks. He dieted okay it wasn't uh, even a great three weeks it was okay he got second one of the biggest shows in the country wow wow i yeah. can't you yeah. can't coach that like, <clears throat> like no. that's that's those are the stories that people don't see those are the stories that people don't um they don't want to see because it, in some way it like dashes your hopes of like being that right because you're like oh my gosh i can never do that no. as a per as a normal person and i would say that's not true i would say quote unquote the more normal you are meaning just like the more kind of like less athletic genetics you have or less body combat whatever it is i just say the harder you have to work on those different things the smarter you have to be about those things and then your abs are made in the kitchen to a degree yeah that then that is applicable but then it yeah, is true yeah yeah right exactly for sure then it is true yeah um and you know it's similar thing people say you know when they want to start training how many days a week should i work out well first of all what is your goal second of all how quickly do you want to get there mm-hmm If you want to get there in a year, we could probably work out three days a week. If you want to mm-hmm. get there in six weeks, we're probably going to work out six days a week. Yeah. You know, NFL NFL combine training, for example, was six days a week for six six to eight weeks, because those guys were such in such terrible shape coming out of football. Football is not like a great shape sport, right. right? Like you're beat up, you're hurt. You know, you're only you know you're if you're a good player, you're playing what maybe 40 snaps a game, mm-hmm. right? Like that's not a ton of volume. Like you so your cardio isn't great. Like We're trying to change them from that into literally like world-class track athletes in like six or eight weeks. Like yep. the combine is insane. Yep. So we train six days a week, but that's all they do. Mm-hmm. Literally, that's all they do. Mm-hmm. They eat, sleep, train. That's it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we need that condensed timeline to make that happen. So it's it's a similar thing with food. If you want to be, you know, certain body composition, certain goal, that's great. How serious you need to be about it depends on how far out that goal is and how quickly do you want to get there. Because a lot of people don't want to admit this, but if they would just be consistent with their food, they'd be a lot closer to their goals, sure. right? But people want to go extreme. They yep. want to go to this fad diet. They want to go to this crazy plan because you get hyped on extreme. Oh, I'm doing this cool thing. I'm working with this cool coach or, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it, it fuels that need to change it. Mm-hmm. But the truth is, if consistently you're making good choices over your whole life, you're never super far out of the goals you want to be doesn't mean you don't swing, you know, life happens, things change, you know, you swing up or down, whatever way you want to go, but you should be somewhat close with your goals if you've been consistent and consistency is key. So to lock in your nutrition, your fuel as just as good as you can, are there any specific approach that you take? I mean, there are many, I've tried several myself. I mean, Keto is more and more popular, even carnivore to a degree. In Rin fasting, there is low carb. I mean, you have vegan, vegetarian. I growing up in a ranch. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think that's going to be a topic to discuss. Maybe, maybe you have an opinion on it. Well, actually, please sh- please share. Like what 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 would you is it just fuel your body, eat clean? Is it simple? What, what is it? Organic? Yeah, I mean, well, the research, vegan, yeah. You know, the research shows that um, a lot of these strategies, low carb, intermittent fasting, they're not necessarily more effective than another in terms of long term outcomes, Mm -hmm. uh, which is, I think, one of the most important things to look at. Anybody can lose weight in, you know, three, four months, but long term outcomes are important. Mm -hmm. So let me give you one thing and then I'll give you my opinion. There's a study uh, when I was in college that we we read about where they followed people over 10 years who wanted to lose weight. Mm -hmm. Okay. 10 years is a long time. It's a long thing for 10 years back ago in your life, like where you are, like whoever's listening to this, like that's a long time. Yeah. All right. So 95% of people over that 10 years who lost weight and kept it off, that's a key point, right? They didn't just yeah. lose it over that time. They kept it off. 95% of them worked out at least four days a week. 
Mm -hmm. right? So if you want to think about that stat, that means 5% of people lost weight and kept it off by working out three days or less, Mm -hmm. which also means that 5% of people did it through diet alone. Mm -hmm. Has to, right? Right. They did it, 95% of people did it in conjunction with an active, healthy lifestyle. And remember, for the purpose of the study, exercise means like planned activity, not like I went and walked my dog, like actual plan measured activity. That's exercise Mm -hmm. and, you know, research, right? So your success rate isn't tied to what you do in the kitchen. It's tied to your physical activity. Yep. And when it comes to your, your nutrition, I would say like whatever plan works well for you. Some people like intermittent fasting because they don't have to think about intermittent fasting, right? They just say, Hey, I'm going to get up. I'm, I'm a busy person. I had some coffee, maybe, um, you know, I don't doctor it up with a ton of sugar and, and cream. I just kind of have it black or whatever. And I start my day. And then before I know it, it's 11 or 12 and I can eat. It's great. I love yeah. that. Okay, good. If, if that if that works well for your you and your lifestyle, then go for it. Um, some people like low carb. Hey, it's just, it's just easier for me if like chips aren't an option. It's easier for me if desserts are just they're just not an option. Mm-hmm. Awesome, go for it. There's no data that shows that one of those things are inherently better than the other, aside from what works well with your lifestyle, which I would argue is the most important you know thing. Um, when it comes to like organics, you know. Um, <laughs> the labels of that stuff is is a whole nother, you know, you, you literally need a degree to explain those labels, right? Like you need to be a rich dietitian to understand what does organic actually mean in a given country because sure. there's different rules and free range and cage free, like all those things have very specific rules on what they actually mean. So, right. um, you know, I, I would say if you're eating fresh food, then that is better than processed food. Yes. Whether it was organic or cage free or whatever the case may be, doesn't matter. Fresh food is always going to be your best option. You know, some people, um, you know, are on this like, they, they think that somehow like going to the grocery store and buying a piece of chicken, you know, is worse for you because it's been quote unquote processed than if you go to like your local butcher. And I would say, well, your local butcher is probably fresher for sure. But if you, every food is processed. It's been processed since the beginning of time. Like, mm-hmm. you, do you think, you got to think that people who farmed hundreds of years ago, if they had a really strong crop one year, they wouldn't keep those seeds and then replant those seeds the next year and not something else. Like they're, they're growing towards, you know, that's, that's, you're, you're processing and growing food towards a certain place. You have to, you know, people used to kill, uh, you know, their animals around this time of year, right? They put them up in a barn, they throw a bunch of salt on them and leave them outside hanging up for months. Mm-hmm. That's process with mm. a ton of sodium. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And people are like, oh, you can't have this, you can't have that. Yes, you can. Like, relax, okay? The thing is- Let, let's, is put a, pick- let's, let's put it more like this. I'd say in a can or in a bag, those, those are, I mean, more so in a can, but especially in like, if they're wrapped up in some plastic, like, okay, yeah. That's like if it's if it's if it's a meat product or some type of vegetable or fruit or so forth. But if it's bagged up and it has a long shelf life, yeah, that's when it's like, all right. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And and the other stuff, like, you know, kind of just go as it makes sense to you. If you don't um, if you have unlimited budget and you want to buy the organic, you know, these animals were able to run in a 10,000 acre forest, like go for it. Right. If you're not able to do that, like, please don't stress about it. The, the nutritional difference is, according to the research, pretty much non-existent. Now, in terms of like being vegan, it's real simple to me. If being vegan is an ethical thing for you, go for it. Go for it. Go crazy. If it's anything other than that, the research doesn't support it, especially if you're an athlete. Right. So you know, to get the amount of protein you would need as an athlete from being vegan, the amount of volume of food that you have to consume is literally inhuman. You cannot eat enough um, beans, you know, lentils, variety of things. You cannot fill your stomach up. It's not big enough to get the amount of protein you need. You have to supplement it. And a lot of people choose like vegan whey proteins and stuff, which is great. No problem with that. But to sit here and say that that somehow optimizes your performance it's just incorrect. And the literature supports it. Um, you know, there's been some documentaries over the last few years of people who've come out and said, you know, that being vegan, like, it was great for them. And what's funny is that all those people, none of them are saying it in the prime of their career. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're all saying it after the fact. 
Uh, I've retired and now I'm vegan and I feel mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, let's just think about what feeling great means. Like, you know, Arnold was obviously a big sponsor behind that documentary. And it's like, okay, Arnold says he feels great. Well, Arnold is also on the record of saying like he would eat a whole chicken and drink a beer after every workout, right? <laughs> um, you know, and Arnold was training two a day, six days a week. Like if I'm training, and it's funny as Luol's house used to be across, I used to see Arnold's house from Luol's house. Hmm. Arnold gets up in the morning. He rides his bike downhill, not uphill. His security team follows him. He goes to Gold's Gym when he's in California. And he goes and does a circuit, you know, around Gold's Gym, just a little circuit, you know, talks to some people and goes back home. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't you think that's easier on your body than what he used to do, which is bodybuilding two hour workouts twice a day, four hours a day? Like, of course you're going to feel better. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you see some of these other athletes like UFC fighters and stuff, like, oh, I feel better. Well, of course you feel better. You're not getting your head beat in every day. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. like, I'm, I'm all for people finding what's, what's right for them. I'm all for it. But if we're going to have a logical scientific discussion about what's optimal for athletes, then we have to have it. And the, the science says athletes need protein to recover. They have to have it. There is no complete vegan protein. It doesn't exist. Animal protein, any animal protein is complete, has a complete amino acid profile. There is no vegetable that has a complete amino acid profile. You have to be really smart about how you mix different things. And another example is, I won't, I won't name the guy's name, but Luol was a teammate with a guy who went vegan mm. during the season. Mm. And the guy lost like 17 pounds. And most basketball players don't have 17 pounds to lose. Nope. Um, he literally, sometimes at halftime, would be kneeling on the floor at his locker because he couldn't stand up. Jesus. And Luol came over to him and said, what like what is what's going on with you he said oh i just you know before the game i had like some celery and like lose like dude you got to get a chef like you have to get someone who's like a nutritionist and a chef like what to, to play professional basketball and to live this lifestyle like that's cool if you want to do it but you have to have an incredible plan and team together to making sure that you're fueling yourself properly yeah, yeah because yeah. you know animal proteins are just complete in a lot of different ways in terms of nutrition things that you can't get from something else, right? And I'm not on the carnivore side either. I'm not on this, like, you know, somehow, I, I don't know if you've seen this guy on Instagram. Have you seen this Liver King guy yet? Oh, it sounds so familiar. Please. I'll have to send it to you if you haven't. It's this guy who is clearly, like, clearly on PEDs, like, clearly on PEDs. Uh, I've been, again, my, my wife was in the world of bodybuilding for a long time. I was around a lot of these guys. Mm -hmm. I know what it looks like when someone's on versus when they're not, right? Yeah. Clear, clearly the guy's on PDs and he's eating like raw um like bull testicles he's eating raw <laughs> like liver like just literally like raw meat and just like mm -hmm. and he's like mm, that's so good this is, uh, this is all you need to do we need to go back to how it used to be and it's like oh you mean when the average age of life was like 38 like we need to go back to that because of disease and foodborne illness like really that's where we need to go back to so like i don't get me wrong i'm not like so pro meat that i'm like you know those people are goober heads too the point is, is, is our stomachs and our, and our metabolism was built to handle a variety of foods, mm -hmm. right? Another thing in that documentary is they have this one doctor on there who's like, look at gorillas. They don't eat meat. Look how strong they are. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, do you think our, our physiology is the same as a gorilla? Yeah. Like I had cows, you know, you, cows have multiple stomachs. That's how come they can eat the way that they eat. The point is we were designed to eat a multitude of foods. And we were designed to get nutrients from different sources, fruits, vegetables, grains, um, you know, meats, et cetera. So like, once you have your ethics sorted out in your head in terms of like where you fall on that stand, and I'll never, you know, knock somebody for their ethical approach to that. If they really believe in their heart, you know, you shouldn't kill an animal for food. Like, okay, like that's fine. You know, but if you're talking about performance, you, you can't deny that we're built. To, we need we need this amount of nutrients. There's there's a literally entire field of research on it. We need this amount of nutrients for optimal performance. Mm -hmm. Okay, the most efficient, effective way to get though is to eat a balance of everything, not to eat completely like shun one any sort of food group. So if you can live in that pocket, I think that you're going to make good decisions. Um, if you're, you know, we had some guys on the South Sudanese team who were vegan. Hmm. Um, when we were doing Afro basket, probably three or four guys, I told them, it's fine, but you guys got to eat a ton of food, a yeah. ton of food because don't be around they me, were, cause I don't want to smell your farts too. <laughs> no, I, just, I, just, I just like, 
<laughs> like, dude, you guys, you have to eat so much because they were already on the lighter side of what's yeah. considered acceptable for a professional athlete. Right. And I'm like, I'm cool. If you guys want to do it, like they had some ethical things, like fine. But like, you, ha- you don't understand. I think it's not like you can just say, I'm going to eat the same amount of food that I used to eat when I ate like, you know, meat because meat, aside from the protein content, there's usually just a natural amount of fats that occur with that as well. Right. I Which mean, also, you know, yeah. just kind of boosts your calories. LeBron did it at 1.2. I mean, and there are photos you can, you can Google that LeBron vegan or vegetarian, and you can see how he's losing weight and how he's becoming pale, how his, his skin is worse. His hair is worse. My, my wife has tried it. There's so many anecdotal, anecdotal stories that I've come across and people that I know it's always the same thing. Always. They drop in energy, drop in focus is great initially because it cleans out their system and then shit hit, hits the fan. But what I was going to say with this, one thing that I want to just want to point out, if you're thinking about how you want to optimize, I agree with everything that you're saying, but also Google inflammatory foods. Just do me that favor. If you listen to this Google inflammatory foods and be cautious on those or be cautious on if it's very, if it's processed or if it's uh, one of those high inflammatory foods, there's a reason why you might get irritated and you don't even know that you're irritated or that you are tired. You get sick all the time or that you have trouble with your stomach. So just, just check that out well, as, as an additional point. Yeah. Well, and I'll just give you some, some real experience on that particular. Um, you know, we live in a world now where, you know, you can live, you can be from one area of the world and live in another, right? That didn't exist really even 50 years ago. People weren't really doing that on a large right. scale, pretty much wherever you were born, where you live. And as a result, you can't forget that your genetics are tuned to a certain region. Yes. So Luol, for example, being from South Sudan, Okay, he lived in America for, well, still does, you know, uh, let's see here. He came over when he was 14, so 21, 22 years at this point. His genetics, his stomach, is built for food in East Africa. Mm-hmm. It, it, that's what his heritage is. That's where yeah. his family lineage is. That's where it's from. So there are certain foods his body does not do well with in America. It's, he gets bloated. Um, to your point about, like, the inflammation side of it, like, yeah, he maybe doesn't recover as well. He doesn't feel as well. Yes. And it was a process for us to go through and figure out what those things were. Now, he had the advantage of having a chef where we could say, Try, do this, don't do that, right? Yeah. Um, but the, the point that you're making is an important one. You, you have to think about what works well with your body and what doesn't. It's that simple. Yeah. It's finding things that work well with your body and eliminate the things that don't. Don't, again, it's like, it's like the training. Don't be so dogmatic about a given approach or thing that you exclude optimal choices. Right. Find what works for you and then harp in on those things. And if it's not working for you, continue to search until you find what does. And you know, hopefully you land in a good spot with it. Ro- I was going to say Rick Ross, <laughs> Jacob Ross. <laughs> I was oh. just talking about Rick Ross <laughs> with another guy the other day. Anyway, um, <laughs> it's been amazing having you on round two. It's, it's always easy. It feels like we leave plenty in the tank. So, but thank you for, for this round. It's been freaking, freaking phenomenal. Yeah, no, absolutely. I am always happy to, to hop on. And clearly, I have no uh, shortage of uh, wanting to talk about this stuff. So, uh, hey, we do it again sometime too if, you, if there's more need for it. If the people want it, you know, we'll make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thanks again. Jacob is really one of those incredibly humble people but knows so much about training and his trait how to connect with people and how to elevate people it's a rare capability to function at such a high level and execute on a day-to-day basis and still caring about your family and being there for everyone that matters so much around you so great deed of respect to jacob and for you who have listened if you enjoyed us Please scroll down on Apple, hit the five stars. It takes you literally five seconds. I truly appreciate you doing this. This helps us spread the message. So thank you for this favor. And if you haven't done so on the other platform, hit subscribe, hit like, even leave a review. This takes you, what, five seconds? A review takes you maybe 30 seconds a minute. And I truly appreciate it. It makes you feel good too, because you know you're helping someone and you're helping spread a message 
that hopefully has helped you as well. So thank you again for tuning in and uh, sending you much love and see you next time.